Come with me as once more we delve into the English medieval social history. This week we look at the origins, evolution and history of the game of darts. Hi right, guys, welcome back to Social History Sunday. Yes, I know, it's Tuesday. Um, I have had no end of technical problems over the last week or so, ranging from broken microphones to lost SD cards, broken cameras to battery charges going, it's just been a nightmare. Um, so hopefully, touch wood, I'm finally going to get this video done. It's probably about the 20th time I've had a go at making this one. I don't know why it's been such a pain. Anyway, we're talking about the game of darts. Now, we're, in, we're basically going to have a look at the origin, the evolution, and in so doing, the history of the game and how it became part of English culture because it is a part of our culture um, it's a very very big part of pub culture I would be very surprised if there are many pubs outside of city centres which don't have a dartboard in one corner of the pub somewhere which is regularly used most pubs um, have a darts team who compete with other teams from other pubs. Most pubs also have a league within the pub themselves for individual players. It's quite ubiquitous. It, it, it's really, really quite popular. And even to the point where it's big money now. Hundreds of thousands of pounds prize money. Millions of pounds prize money for international world championship matches. A lot of countries have even got their own league systems now. And then we have world championships with country playing country. Even to the point that Sky News now broadcasts live games as and when they happen, usually on a Thursday night, from all over the world. It's big money. It's a big part of British English culture. Um, but where did it all begin? Where did it start? Now, there are lots of minor thought, lines of thought as to how it began. And we're going di to discard most of them. The Romans, nothing to do with them. Greeks, nothing to do with them. Um, Mongols, nothing to do with them. Not even India or places like that. Bear in mind that there was very little contact between India and China in the f at the time we're talking about because we're talking the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries, the Dark Ages, as a lot of people, the early medieval. So the first thing, the first idea that we're going to look at, the first popular origin story, is based on the Irish and the Irish Vikings. Um, they had a weapon called a javelin and it was specifically called a javelin. Today a lot of the time we think of a javelin as just being um, a piece of sports equipment. But back in the day the original javelin from Ireland was a lightweight spear designed for throwing and it was called a javelin. Not to be dis a lot of people think that the Romans had javelins, they didn't. They had peel them. Same basic principle, it was an armour piercing throwing spear that a lot of people mistakenly call a javelin. Um, so, we're looking back to the Irish. Their javelin was designed to, to, you had a short run up and you threw it, designed to be thrown 100, 100 metres or so um, and do some damage. The javelin we had to have today, designed to do exactly the same thing. It's a shaped piece of wood, a shaped stick, barreled, um, so it's wider in the middle than it is at the end, and one end has a sharp pointy object or stuck on the end of it, a sharp pointy, pointy bit. But the important thing here is there is no fletching, no feathers, no flights of any description on the back. That's an important distinction. So on those grounds, because we still use it and still have the word today, because names, language tends to stick and it tends to travel through time periods, um, which is why we have things today which are still named in a similar, or if not the same, to what they were when they were first instigated. For instance, if you're a plumber, you take your, the name of your trade yeah, from the Roman Latin for lead, which was plumbum. Sorry, I can't help but giggle when I say that. It's, I'm such a child. And plumbum is 
what the Romans used to make the first effective pipes for plumbing systems. So you're using lead to put into systems that are put into place by plumbers for transportation of water etc around the domestics. And that word has stuck. Lots of other examples but we won't go into them. So for that reason I'm discounting the javelin, even though lots of people think it's the same thing. Right, um, the arrow myth is based on two entries within his, the historical record. Now the first one is really really obscure um, and it's like the late 1200s early 1300s and it basically says that it describes men at arms, soldiers, sitting around the campfire while on campaign playing, playing darts. That's all it says. It doesn't describe the dart, it doesn't describe the game, it just says men playing darts. Now that's the earliest mention we have from the say, like 1290 to 1310. Jump forward a little bit to the Hundred Years War and we have another, um, I can't remember what year it's from, I've never actually read it in context of a time period, but I know it comes from the early Hundred Years Wars. So we're looking at 1370, 1380, that sort of time period. And it describes men playing darts around the campfire and similar sort of the thing, but throwing at an upended barrel. But it doesn't, at the, it doesn't actually specifically say broken arrows. That's just the, um, the, the spin that lots of people have put onto it. The reason I don't think that is the, is the source is because we already know that the game exists. It's already been mentioned before. So the game didn't start during the Hundred Years' War with men gathered around campfires throwing arrows about. So that's the first thing. Second thing, if you're sat around a campfire and you're throwing things at the end of a barrel, why would you throw broken ones when you've probably got a half a dozen, dozen, couple of hundred archers sat around you who've got quivers or sheaths full of arrows that you could borrow complete and intact to throw at this barrel you've got. It's the second thing. The third thing is the broken the idea of broken arrows themselves being used for anything doesn't make sense to me. For one good reason. Arrows were expensive. They were ammunition. The English armies in France during the Hundred Years Wars went through millions of arrows over the course of the years they were recycled, especially the arrow points, the needle bodkins and the short bodkins, such as that. They were recycled. So yes, guys did when go out after the battle and collect arrows, broken, damaged, whatever. They collected them all up, as many as they could get. And they were taken back, but they were then given to the camp Fletcher, who would, out of a broken arrow, or two broken arrows, would make one good one. It was a way of saving resources. You recycle the arrowheads onto possibly broken arrowheads would be taken off and put to one side for reforging and another good one put on. Um, or a snapped arrow would have the arrowheads put off and they'd be put on a new shaft. Old fletchings might be taken off and replaced and repaired and it was an ongoing process. So you wouldn't, your ordinary man at arms wouldn't have broken arrows to play with. So again, that makes no sense to me at all. Especially when You've got full, complete arrows. Now, we're going to jump back in time again. We're going to go back to 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century. And we're going to jump back into the third origin story. And this is the one that I've sort of come across. I haven't seen any other mentions of it in terms of the origin of darts. But it makes complete sense to me. And we're talking about language again. Now, the game the object. The game is called darts, which is a plural of dart. It's play, played with a dart, a set of darts. Now if you take the word itself, dart, it has its etymology in three distinct languages. We have High Germanic or Old Germanic, we have Old Norse and we have Old English or Anglo-Saxon. Now if we look at the Germanic, the Germanic dart means to move quickly and secretly. So you're flitting, you're darting. The Old Norse means to move quickly and quietly. So we have move quickly and silently, quickly and 
quietly, and then we have the, the Anglo-Saxon. They all involve movement. They all involve secrecy or stealth or quietness. And then we have the Anglo-Saxon. And the word literally means to throw suddenly, but it also means to move quickly. So we've got effectively three meanings, all very similar, from three different languages about the same object. That's, sorry, about the same name. Now, if you look at the, but there's another thing. You look at the Vikings, the old Norse Vikings of the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century, they actually had a weapon called, now, if I've got this translation correct, it's, uh, oh, it's gone. A dearth dart. Now, dearth in Anglo-Saxon means short or shortage. It also means short in Old Germanic. So in Old, Old Norse, it's going to have a similar sort of meaning. I haven't been able to figure it out. But I believe it means a short spear. A dart is a short spear for throwing. So we have a, 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 a distinct object from the Anglo-Saxon and the Viking. You put the two together, you have a short spear which is designed to be thrown suddenly. And that's how you throw a dart. If you throw a javelin, you pull it back, you wind yourself up, have a short run, and then you unwind and throw. It's a full body movement. If you throw a dart, it's a short, sudden, thrusting movement, like that. That's how you throw a dart, or even a bigger dart, like that. It's all from the shoulder, and it's a sudden, forward, thrusting to throw the dart. And that's exactly what the Anglo-Saxon means, to throw with a sudden movement. And then we have the short, the dearth dart from the, from the Viking. And we have the secretive. Now where the secretive thing comes in is we have descriptions of Anglo-Saxon and Viking warriors in the Chronicles and the Sagas who were carrying a big, big shield and they've got short throwing spears, darts, hidden behind their shields. And when the moment is right, they pull them up and throw them at the enemy. It's like, so there's a secretive coming in. So we've got three distinct languages throwing with three meanings, which are very, very similar, describing a single object, which is used in all situations in the same way. So there we have the origin of the dart. That's what the dart is. And if you look at the descriptions of the Viking darts, they're usually three or four foot long, with a sharp bodkin type or a compressed barbed type head with fletchings on the back, with feathers or flights on the back. So we've got the name, we've got the object, we've got the original source of the object. Now we just have to figure out how it became again. Right, so we're looking, if you look in the, I'll add something else to this here. If you look in the, the contemporary art um, illustrations of the time period um, from the 10th century onwards up until the beginning of the 14th century you will see a lot of depictions of basically darts these big viking style anglo-saxon style darts which are about four foot long three to four foot long fletchings on one end pointy a bit on the other end and they are used quite extensively and depicted being used during siege warfare. Now, question, why, if we are entering the age of the English longbow, are people in castles under siege using something as archaic and ineffective really as a thrown spear? And I think the answer to that is actually quite simple. Nobody seems to have grasped this, this concept um, that I've seen. I'm sure somebody has, but I haven't seen it, it anywhere yet. Um, it's easy to use. You've got people within the castle that's under siege who are probably not trained in, in using a bow. They might be young, young lads under the age of 15 who are not, not quite strong enough to use an effective bow. It might be older guys who are infirm for, because of injury or illness or anything like that. You've got young girls, young boys, young girls, women, serving staff within the castle who've got no military training or experience and yet if you give them something like this which is one version of 
a throwing dart. Um, also called the French arrow by the time, by the, by the way, by the time we get to Norman period. Give them half a dozen of these, and they can, with the use of a throwing string, which I believe is why they're called French arrows, because the string comes from France. Give them a throwing string, which the Normans brought over with them. They can hurl these, especially a 12, 13 year old lad in the medieval era would be able to fling these about 100 yards. And they're quite heavy, probably made out of hickory or ash or something, um, with a short bodkin or even a long bodkin head on them. And basically what you do, as I'm sure you know, everybody knows about French arrows, and we used to call them Yorkshire arrows or just throwing arrows. String with a piece of be with a bead or knot, draped over, wrapped around, trapped between the stick and the string, pull the string tight and fling. And I know from personal experience that these can be thrown over a hundred yards with no problem whatsoever. Um, I even had my son, my eldest, throwing these around when he was a kid. And he was regularly, and we're talking eight, nine, ten, ten year old, and he was regularly getting up close towards 70, 80 yards. So there we go. So there we have them being used as a weapon. But again, now we need to dis explain how they became a game. Now, in this, is this situation, the winters during the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, 15th century in England were known to be particularly harsh and brutal and cold. So lots of people stayed indoors. There was not a lot of work done. Um, when we get, and it's possibly one of the reasons why we had the famine in the, in the early 1300s because there was just no work getting done and the Black Plague came along. But I think the harsh winters played something with, to it as well. So we have a situation. Nobody can go outside because it's so cold and wet and damp and there's three or four foot of snow lying around. So everybody's staying indoors. Halfway through winter, you've played all the card games you've got. Um, you've played all the other silly games you'd be playing. People are getting bored. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of the kids in the castle grab some of these, which they've been shown how to use in times of siege, and they go into the Great Hall and they just start flinging them. Probably at an, un an upended table, possibly, or an upended stool on a table, and they just start throwing them. And this is the origin of the game, I think. It, now, it precludes archery as the origin of the game. Yes, you could shoot a bow indoors. However, if you were shooting at a table or a stool, you'd split it in fairly short order. And don't forget at this time that the target butts for archery were just a mound of earth with a rope circle laid on them. So nobody was really using a specific target for archery. But imagine, you're, in a, you're bored, you're in the castle, you've got some of these out and you're flinging them, not from any great distance, you're not using the throwing string, maybe 10, 10 yards, and they will stick, or they might not stick, into a still. Or, so there we have the origins of the game. And then over the next 100 years or so, they get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Until we end up with, if I can find them, darts. Short darts. They're no longer war darts. They are toy darts. Now, we'll go back to the Hundred Years War. Now, as we've already established, they weren't creating the game, they were playing the game. And I think that the game in the 1200s starts to get played by men at arms on campaign, quickly spreads around the whole country and starts being seen, not just in the castles during the winter, but also in the alehouses during the summer or during the spring and autumn, being played by anybody and everybody. Not just the men at arms, but everybody. But men at arms, soldiers, even to this day, if they go away and campaign, if they're posted overseas, what do they do? They take a little bit of home with them in the form of photographs. Today we're talking. Um, CDs, pictures, things like that. What did they take with them in the medieval? Even to like modern soldiers today might take um, a game with them, a, a deck of cards, things like that. And I think the medieval soldiers would do the same thing. They might have a lock of their loved one's hair. They might have a set of playing cards. They might take a whistle or a flute with them. They might also take a set of darts, 
with which to play darts around the campfire on the night time. They don't need to take a board because you can just draw a circle inside of a wagon and just fling away or use the end of a barrel as was suggested in the origin story or even the end of a fallen log. Just sit there and fling. And I think these would actually quickly become a part of the average man-at-arms personal belongings, personal kit they would take away with them, along with extra bowstrings, sleeping ba uh, blanket, you get the idea. Now, we're continuing with the evolution of the game. I think we've covered the source, the origin of the game. Um, again, I'm just, just my opinion, but now we're getting into historical fact now. Lots of people will tell you that Henry VIII invented the game. Not so. As we've already established from historical record and from the language clues, darts already existed. And I think the game already existed long before Henry VIII started playing it. But he did create a version of it. And it was basically a wooden board about eight or nine inches in diameter with, cir with wire circles impressed into it. And the way you play it, basically, throw a dart into a circle, you get a point. Miss the circle, you don't get a point. And you keep doing until you're playing against somebody. You could play this game by yourself until you filled all the squares. Somebody mentioned to me year, ages ago that Henry VIII's game, basically what you did, it was a competitive game, quite nail-biting, quite intense, is you threw your darts. And if you got one circle, you left that dart in the circle and you pulled the other two that missed. Then your opponent played, and he threw his darts, and say he got three darts, three circles left, three darts left, he's won the game. He might only get one, which means there's one circle, there's one at each field, but there's two circles left. You've got two darts. You throw your darts, you miss with the first one. You throw your second one, you get a hunt, another point. You're in the circle. There's one circle left. Your opponent has got two darts left as well. So he's got two chances to score throws the dart, he misses. Throws the second dart, he misses. Nail-biting stuff. You've got one dart left. There's one ring left. Bang, bullseye, you've won. That sounds like quite a good game to me, that actually. But another game that Henry played was um, a board with concentric scoring zones in it. Red bullseye, gold inner, black outer. Now, we don't know how he scored it, but I think that that was actually the antecedents of the game that went around the country as a result of royal patronage. And it went into all the pubs, which were newly created by the way, so you had newly created pubs needing a decent board, board, uh, pub game. Now don't forget the English are weird people. If our monarchy shows favouritism or enthusiasm for something, we take it up as well, whether that's a new form of clothing, new kind of food, for instance Henry VIII again, he introduced turkey as a Christmas, me a Christmas meal. And we grabbed it onto the idea wholeheartedly. And even to this day, we still have turkey. And you can thank, in England, we can thank Henry VIII for that, because he thought turkey was fantastic. So we all had to have it as well. It's the same with the dart game. He was playing this game with the three concentric circles, red, gold, black, that quickly went into the public sphere. And over the next couple of hundred years, it evolved. The board went from being 8 inches to being 18 inches. And it went from having 3 scoring zones to 20 scoring zones and the bullseye. And that's the game which, if you buy a dart set today, with a board and two sets of darts, on Amazon, buy one tonight, you get delivered tomorrow or the day after, turn the board over, you've got the modern game on the front, turn the board over, 9 times out of 10, you've got that original expanded version of the game that Henry VIII played on the back, even to this day. So we've got the evolution into the game that went into the pubs. Now where did the modern game come from? Now you've got to thank military men again, servicemen, soldiers, off-duty soldiers on campaign or on overseas deployment. Now the modern game was invented by a guy called Brian Gamblin in 18 1886. He invented the game. Now it was probably one of many regional variations that were around at the time. But the difference was uh, that it's probably, this is just my opinion, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he got that game and who is a local and his local just happened to be the local pub that lots of local servicemen went to. It's probably a, maybe a barracks nearby because Lancashire had its own regiment for a long time. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if officers got into that pub um, and they saw the game and they started playing it. Now don't forget that the 18, 1860s, 1870s, all the way up to the 1900 is the height of the, the, the British Empire, the English Empire. So you've got servicemen going all over the world. China, Singapore, Hong Kong, India, Africa, all over the place. And they take games with them, just like the men at arms in the Hundred Years' War did. So you've got an officer seeing this game, and he's got a copy of it, he's bought a copy of it, he's made of him, got Brian Gamlin to make him a copy of it. Um, and he's took it to India with him, say, or he's took it to Africa, and he's playing it in the officer's mess. The other officers see it, they start playing it with him. Before long, everybody in the regiment is playing it. A couple of years abroad, overseas, um, in Africa or wherever, they come back, they bring the game with them. First thing they do, they take it to the pub and say, have you seen this lads? And they get all the friends and family playing this new game of darts in the pub. Now we know that at this point it's become really, really popular because there's actually photographs and documentary evidence of soldiers in the First World War playing this new game of darts in the trenches and in the pubs. It becomes really popular again during the interwar periods. And then we have footage, actual film footage, and you can find it on YouTube, of American servicemen stationed in the UK during the Second World War playing darts with the locals in the pub. And then, you, then the Americans take that home with them as well. That's how it ends up in America. So there we go. That's my theory. That's my opinion on, it, on the origin and the evolution and the history of the game of darts. Now it's quite important for English culture because it's in every pub. Come over to England for a holiday, for a visit. Time your visit, as I've said before, to make to, for an international sporting event like cricket or golf, football, rugby, whatever. Get yourself in the pub, enjoy the spectacle, especially a football match, an international. And then come back during the week. Go into the pub, midweek, mid-afternoon. Ask, if there's no dart game going on, ask if you can borrow a set of darts. You could even say, can I borrow a set of arrows? Because everybody knows what you mean. Because they do they resemble small arrows, and that's the only reason they're actually called arrows, is because they resemble small arrows. And they'll give you a set of darts, and you can go and play in the corner. There might be an old guy there. You could even say to him, I fancy a game. And the chances are, I'd be like, oh yeah, okay then. Somebody to talk to, one of the old boys. And he, but he might even show you a thing or two. Might teach you how to get, play the, the proper game properly. Um, and there's no better way of getting to know an Englishman and, or English men than to have a drink over a game of darts in a pub. Anyway, hope you found that interesting. Stay safe, keep swinging the sticks, and we'll talk again soon. Cheers, guys.